The changing landscape of high street retail and the growth of the online marketplace has introduced a range of conflicting challenges and opportunities for today's brands and retailers. Whereas digital retail offers the promise of global reach, the real key to success is in understanding how you can make digital work alongside your bricks and mortar business to strengthen your roots in the community that you're already in. Our next expert panel explores this in much more detail, sharing their tips and tricks along the way. Please welcome Lisa May, founder of In The Retail, in conversation with Ebby Sinte, founder of Our Lovely Goods, Lucy Estevy, founder of Acorn and Pip, and Tammy Gao, founder of Hunter & Co. So guys, thank you so much for joining me for this um, Digital Retail Masterclass, um, specifically looking at how brick and mortar and digital retailers are actually the perfect partnership um, in terms of really creating success within a modern retailer. Um, I think there's just so many challenges that we've had within this just ever changing landscape, which is retail, whether it's COVID and Brexit, whether it's just the huge competition that we're seeing from such large organizations like the Assos's of the world and the Amazons. Um, but I do think that both brick and mortar businesses, along with um, online retailers um, really, really need to be able to provide this omni-channel approach, not to just survive in these moments, but also to really thrive. So I'm going to jump in, first of all, with um, SEO. And I think we can all identify that more than ever, uh, consumers are turning to Google to find products and places to shop. Um, I think from my perspective, I just want to encourage people to, to show up, to make sure that you're setting up those, that, you know, those Google or uh, Yelp and Facebook businesses business listings, you know, and not just the not just the basics of uh, your name, address and phone number. So just as sort of, um, you know, successful uh, independent businesses within the digital space, what um, what successes have you guys seen from um, from Google or any other sort of listing that you've used over the last sort of like nine months? Well, I think taking on your last point about um, having to write in the language of your customer. I think um, in, instead of your question talking about what success is, I think what actually started for me was a challenge or kind of like a failure. So I was spending a lot of time right, you know, drafting my product descriptions and blogs in a language that I thought sounded fancy or, you know, kind of in the interior speak, putting lots of jargon, as you say. And I think that as I was kind of studying what other brands were doing and also reading other content out there and also speaking to some SEO experts, I realized that I really have to be writing this in the exact language that somebody would be putting into Google search. And I think that is definitely changed how I've been kind of putting my website together and also kind of the traffic that's been coming in and also I guess just sounding a little bit more genuine in your content anyway so um that's definitely yeah. that I've been yeah I love that you mentioned blogging as well because I think that there's a lot of people think that that sort of notion's gone but actually from from an SEO perspective I always really encourage people to write blog posts write articles not for the sake of people reading them if you don't want your customers to see them but from an seo and, an, and making your website really searchable it's fantastic so i'm so glad that that's something that you've noticed yeah and i think also putting you know as you say with blog content it's not just about putting it on your website you can then use it as email campaigns but and also pinning any images onto pinterest using that um you can post your blog posts in twitter and Instagram so writing one blog post can actually kind of touch across lots of different channels and reach people in different ways yeah just reutilizing the content so yeah amazing um I think another thing just to add in there is the um the ability to upload your stock um to um Google local inventory I think that is something that definitely we've seen um, some success with trends particularly in more smaller communities they are able to be able to flag up so I definitely think that um, any retailers that are looking to make that transition onto digital in a big way um, it's definitely worth looking at those um, that local Google um, inventory really good one um, 
so next, and this is probably one of my favorite topics, I want to chat to you guys about focusing on creating content that um, helps your customers fall in love with you. Because um, the more and more we read, the more studies are showing that consumers are wanting to shop with brands that, you know, align with their values and brands that they feel connected to and brands that they feel that they resonate with them, um, you know, and always encouraging people to tell your story um talk to me about your product give me that behind the scenes look um at what is happening behind the digital space as well as the physical stores you know give us give us a sneak peek i think that there is um, a little bit of a secret sauce at the moment you might call it um about focusing on building your your brand's customer base rather than just chasing um, those immediate sales, because I'm sure you ladies will agree with me, it's quite exhausting, um, the constant chase. And um, Mary Porter said right at the very, very beginning uh, of the pandemic, she said that brands that will survive this, as in that they'll survive the pandemic, are brands that you will want to buy into and not brands that you simply want to buy from. And I think that that is so key um you know i'd love to hear from you guys in terms of you know where do you feel like maybe you've had to step out of your comfort zone a little bit and go oh i've got to put myself out there a little bit more but have you seen that success what is the success that you've seen from that um whether it's social or sales do you know what i mean what is what has kind of triggered things off for you um i think for us when we first started out, um, this topic resonates quite a lot with me because when we first started out, um, we were kind of trying to portray like a very polished sort of brand look on social media and just, you know, really nice product pictures, which are obviously important, but just kind of looking very polished and very professional and stuff. And I think as we've kind of learned and gone along, we have kind of shown ourselves a bit more. Um, so we are like a family run business. And I think people do um, quite like to see the people behind the brand as well. So on social media, we've, you know, tried to incorporate as much as we feel kind of comfortable doing um, mm -hmm. bits of our personal life and behind the scenes of, you know, what we do day to day. Um, and that has definitely like help people to kind of buy into the brand as well. Um, and I think also in terms of the content we create, we try to also really make it feel like the customer can kind of dive in, like the pictures that we take, we try and kind of make them portray like, you know, slow living, um, you know, cozy kind of lifestyle, the things that our brand is like about. Um, mm -hmm. And it just kind of helps people to, see themselves using the products rather than kind of just like a hard sell of like oh we've got this candle or we've got this and that and it's just yeah it kind of helps people kind of delve in to the brand a bit more yeah definitely and I think that that's something that I, I talk a lot about in the sense of during the pandemic you were probably the most relatable and the closest that you're ever going to be to your customers because we were all going through the same thing whether they were your customers or not we were living through the same thing and I think it just made us so relatable and, and much easier to connect and I think as, as soon as people started to go God, yeah, they love to know what I was, that fancy breakfast I was cooking the kids, you know, 30 seconds before I was attaching them to the computer. Like it really resonated with people and they just got such great engagement and connection from them. Um, Lucy, is that something that you've you've seen within your business, just allowing maybe a little bit more of an insight? Yeah, I think as a business, it's always been kind of run from the heart. And I think most small businesses would say that's exactly how they run their business. And we have always, or I have always used my social media to kind of let people in and see that we are small. Um, and I think there was, I, I kind of used to be afraid of people knowing how small we were as a business, but actually I love, I love being small and I love showing people, you know, I'm just writing my emails whilst the kids are next to me and the baby is just thrown up or, you know, whatever, like this is how we run our business and it's why we do it. And it's because, you know, it's, it's kind of how, it's the only way we can do it. 
Um, and I think when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden, so we have a store, so it was quite easy for me to kind of show people behind the scenes in the shop. But when the shop was closed, you know, there's there's none of that to kind of show. So it was showing people behind the scenes at home. Um, this is how, you know, this is how the shop is going to run for the next, you know, what we thought was going to be a few months, but, you know, little did we know. Um, and it was kind of letting people into our community, our family, showing them what our business looks like from the inside out. And I mean, we have a store that is run as kind of an experiential store. We have the cafe in the shop um, and we used to have a play area and as well as the store. Um, and that was kind of re the way that retail was going until um, COVID kind of kiboshed that. Um, so we've kind of had to take that experiential retail and kind of throw it out in a different way. Our customers really like to see what our products look like in situ um, and kind of how our store runs as a family concept store. Um, so we've had to use social media to show that without the store, which is really hard, but um, we've kind of done that through inviting people into our home, um, showing them how we use the products with our kids. Um, and so I had a baby actually the first week of lockdown, the first lockdown. So um, it was quite nice to kind of have people there with me because I had no friends around me. I had no family around me. Uh, well, I, my family, but, you know, the family you need as well. Um, and so it was really nice to kind of let people in to see that. Um, and it really grew our community further um, mm -hmm. solidified our community for sure. Um, and it was just, it was really heartwarming to know that people were wanting you as a business to succeed yeah. the pandemic. They wanted to go along with you. And um, I think everyone would kind of agree that that's definitely the way it's going in 2021. People are buying into the people running the business. People are buying into your story, your vision, your values. Mm -hmm. um, and it does help to take them along with you. Sometimes, you know, you have to kind of put barriers in place. You can't just let them like, you know, be in the bath with you. But um, <laughs> it's still it's still good to show them the human side of, of your business. Yeah, I think you you talk about it as if you sort of like solidify this little tribe of people who yeah. were just, like, you, know, you know, coaching you on and, and wanting you to sort of do well, like for them really, as well as for yourself. And I quickly just want to jump on your point that you said about COVID's done a kibosh to your in-store experience. And I couldn't disagree anymore. I think that really? you know, <laughs> online but I think there is going to be an absolute, there's going to be more need, more desire for people to have reasons to come into stores, whether that's they want to learn about their products, whether they want to test their products, whether they just want to talk with their neighbours about their products. I really think that we have been surrounded by certain members of our family for a certain amount of time. And as soon as we can, we are going to go wild. I think you're going to have to look at it differently. I think you're going to, whether it's you know workshops or education or guest speakers I think that actually to own a retail space within um whatever the moment's going to be after this I think it's going to be really exciting but I don't think it necessarily has to be a focus on selling I think it's that there is going to be a, a place for it so yeah you be excited about your retail store and all the things you can do about it because I think yeah. it's I think it's that kind of um that touchy-feely retail experience that um, I think we all used to enjoy so much when you'd go into a store and like you'd see a candle and you'd pick it up and you'd smell it and you'd really kind of buy into that really tactile experience. And I think that obviously has had to stop. Um, and what it will look like next, obviously, will be there will be a resurgence of in-store retail experiences Um you know, people are so nostalgic about going shopping with their friends and their family and finding these treasures in store because the joy of going shopping will never will never die. It will just look different. And that's kind of our position, isn't it, to kind of jump on that and show what what physical retail can do. And I think that's what's key. I think it's the you know, you mentioned about going shopping with friends. Like, I think that's an experience. Like, I may decide to purchase everything I need online, but I am probably going to want to still go and experience something with my friends and go into that space. Yeah, I might make some purchases. And I think that's just where you've got to, that's where the compromise is. And I think, you know, that's where the digital is so important. But I, 
people, many people may disagree with me, but I think there is always going to be a space for physical, for physical needs um, in terms of shopping. Online, you have, um, there is so much competition out there as well. So, and sometimes I think customers get so overwhelmed by how much choice there is out there. And also, um, you know, I always find that when I buy something, um, I enjoy the experience most when I'm not actually looking for it. I'm kind of shopping, you know, walking down a high street and you see something and you buy it. And sometimes you don't know that you want to buy something until you see it. And I think when you're online and you're kind of going, okay, I want rugs. And then you just type something in and you see you're kind of overwhelmed by all the choices. And I use rugs as an example because we sell rugs and actually um, online, we've never really had much traffic or so many rugs um, because they are quite expensive. And then when we had, um, I pop up for two weeks it was really interesting to see that the number of people that were coming into our store were going straight for the rugs feeling them and I sold more rugs in those two weeks than I did in the last six months online and clearly as you said Lucy the whole touchy-feely experience is really important but also when you're look when you're buying something that's a little bit more expensive I guess you just want to like be able to touch and feel it and and, and yeah you think that you'd maybe nurtured those customers? It wasn't a case of just cold customers were coming in and buying books. Do you think you'd really nurtured them on that digital space? And then it's like the opportunity to shop it in real life. They're then jumping on it. Is that maybe what it was? Yeah, exactly. So when um we had a we had a stall at the house and garden last year as well, and I think we kind of put a lot of like um you know, saying on social media, we're going to have a stall there. And actually, it was really nice to see the number of people who came and said, oh, we've been following you for a while. We love your product, but it's really great to actually be able to see your products in person. So that's why they took the opportunity to come and look at the products. And then they were sold in that way. And I can understand why when you're just looking at things online, you're not sure. So I agree with you that even though I'm an online store only, I really am looking forward to the opportunity to be more physical when things start to open up. <laughs> Fingers yeah, crossed. Give, yeah. Yeah. yeah, giving them the opportunity. Hmm. Yeah, really good. So that kind of is a really great segue into my next topic, which is just about capturing your audience and, you know, what we hear a lot in um, the digital world about sort of call to actions and that sort of you in order to be able to really like nurture those customers, like, you know, you've meant, you've just mentioned, Tammy, you have to be able to capture them. You have to be able to, you know, get their details, whether that is on social media, there is there slight challenges around social media in terms of the algorithm and the noise, um, you know, but some sort of simple call to actions on your website that, um, you know, you're not converting them instantly into a sale, but it's that, that nurturing, that ongoing building of a relationship. It allows you to build that like, know and trust factor Factor. You know, people traveled however far to see you and your business, Tammy, because they'd they'd learned to like you, to trust you, to know you. And that's kind of what you you do if you're if you're really sort of wanting to move things into a digital presence. You've got to be able to capture them. Um, I'm going to talk about a few examples that I often refer to, but I'd love to hear from 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 you guys on in terms of what you've used and seen in the past that's worked. Um, Obviously, that you've got your pop up um, on your website in terms of joining your mailing list. My only recommendation would be that it's after 20 to 25 seconds. I think what we tend to see is that if you like interrupt them in their browsing too soon, they'll just instantly click. No, I'm sorry, you you disturbed me. I'm not 100 percent sure if I want to. So my only encouragement would be allow them to browse for, you know, 15, 20, 25 seconds before you're then asking them to, to join. Um, I also think and I see a lot of success in calling your your mailing list something. So it's not join our mailing list. It's, you know, sign up here to be part of our VIP list or um, I encourage people to have exclusive access. So when you're saying you've got a sale, your um, your VIP list will get 24 hours ac early access or to new product launches, things like that. I think rather than it just being about, please give me your data because I want to bombard you in your inbox, it's, it's more than that. It becomes like you're building that community and that tribe. Um, and also, obviously, there's the download or freebies. Um, I think that's a really good way of getting people because it's not just giving their email. There's an actual exchange. It's an exchange of something, whether it's a how-to guide or a video or a downloadable um, 
was lots of downloadable colouring illustrations for children to do during lockdown. Um, I think my only advice there is make sure that whatever your download is, it's um, it's really relevant to your customer because there's no point getting doing a colouring download that's perfect for mum, but actually your ideal customer is maybe somebody who doesn't have children. I think in terms of making sure that whatever you're offering them really aligns with you and your customer, I think that's really vital. Um, is that something that you guys are conscious of being in that digital space of making sure that even if you're not capturing that sale, you're mindful of what's happening on your website to, to capture them? Um, Lucy, is there anything that you've sort of used in the past and seen success from? Um, well, I mean, I've spent a lot of time um, working out how much it costs for me to get a customer onto my website. And then when you start to work out how much that customer costs you, you think, like, I'm not letting them go. So <laughs> knowing your numbers and learning out really how much it costs you to acquire that customer is really important. And it kind of drives you on to really nurturing that customer. So we do have, um, we have thought about like lead, magnet, ma lead magnets and things like that before, but our customer is quite diverse. So it's been quite hard to pin something down. So we do offer um, a discount. Um, and then we um, segment our email list out to quite an extent that we are really talking to the right person. So our messaging um, is as close as it can be. Um, to that person so we don't tend to just send out like blanket um, newsletters which we never call them but um, that kind of thing so we try to really understand who our customer is who who we are talking to and it helps us to kind of nurture that customer in the hope that they will stay with us and um, we will be top of mind when they've got a birthday or for Christmas or for any sort of event in their life that we could be of, um, of use um, so I think knowing who your customer is and really talking directly to them is a really good way of keeping them with you. Because once you've got them, well, you know, it's it's great to have them with you. So you don't want to let them go. And obviously you don't want to spam them. So talking directly to them is really important, whether that is through email or I know there's like some companies that you can sign up with, like as in marketing, uh, email marketing things where you can text them and things like that. Yeah. I've always felt like that was perhaps too way out of my comfort zone. And I think as a consumer myself, if I started getting text messages, I would think, oh gosh, here we yeah. go. So I, I, so yeah, so I, I don't do that. But I know, you know, some, some companies do it really effectively. So there's loads mm -hmm. of ways to communicate with your customer. Um, you just kind of have to know your customer and know what you think they would, they would respond to. Yeah. I think as well, just off the back of what Lucy's saying, um, touching on email, like marketing and things, um, we also kind of are quite conscious that our customers are probably, you know, quite spam averse, as I think most people are. Um, and so we, we don't even call our newsletter a newsletter, we call it um, like an edit. And it's like a monthly edit that we do. And we try and put in content that is just got nothing to do with kind of selling but content that we know that they're interested in so we do like Spotify playlists sometimes um like for the season or even sometimes sharing like other small brands that we found like you know in the month or something um just content to kind of keep them wanting to read the newsletter um and as well sharing behind the scenes of things that we are working on um so getting them excited for things that are to come even though it's not maybe already out yet so it kind of builds the excitement in the, the customer too um so those are sorts of things that we've seen that have worked quite well in terms of kind of building trust in us um because we're not just spamming them um and also just kind of getting people interested in in what we're doing yeah, I think that it's interesting what you've both said about the spamming. And I, I think you, it's good to kind of work on like a serve, 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 and then sell basis. Just make sure that you're giving them a lot more than what you're actually asking for them back. And even, you know, even if you're, if it's that really great behind the scenes video of you making your product or packing deliveries or, you know, unpacking newness, whatever it is, there isn't a subtle element of selling to it, but it isn't as brash and as bold as, click here to shop this link, which is what people don't want to be seeing all the time. Um, so I think it's really interesting that it's about giving them more to be part of this list, but also that exclusivity, which is why I think giving them early access to things 
not just to get new people on the list, but the people that are already there, like Lucy said, keeping them on there because they know that there's value in being on that list. Um, and really, it's just this psychology of nurturing them um, to a point where I think it was Lucy that said, you know, you you just need to be top of mind. Like you don't need to be that person they need to shop with 24 seven. You just need to be the person they think of when they do need something. And the subtle sort of like, I don't want to say drip feed, <laughs> but the subtle drip feed of content and just your presence is a really, really savvy yet subtle way of doing that. Um, Tammy, I wasn't sure if you were going to jump in. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, I just wanted to say it's also, I think it's also important to understand um, why your customer goes on different kind of channels and what their reasons are. So I think, Ebby, you were saying that, you know, people, and, and I found this as well, that people find it quite interesting to know how your products are made, where you're seeing it from. I think I saw from your stories that you guys went on a sourcing trip recently. Like, I, I, I think that's really interesting. But I think the right channel for that is probably a social channel like Instagram. So I think people want to go in there and they want to see that. And they, you know, everyone's inherently a little bit nosy. So when they see stories or photos and they're like, oh, that's really interesting. And also it really helps them buy into the brand. But um, when you're sending emails, they might not necessarily want to see an email, a, a video, a photo of how your product were made, because the, the reason why they use emails might be for getting information or, um, do you know what I mean? I just think that there, there's also maybe a place for how you want to be reaching out to your customers. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of discounts and, and, you know, new product launches, we use email campaigns for that because I think people are happy to receive like short and snappy things that they know also it's for their benefit rather than yours. And then the storytelling might be more on a channel where there's more interaction and engagement. Yeah, I think that's that kind of <laughs> that really leads me into the next kind of thing that I wanted to mention, which was that strat that that digital marketing strategy of making your social media, whether it's organic or paid, um, kind of partner with getting them onto those platforms that you own, whether that is your mailing list, whether that is your website, and just working together, I suppose. And like you said, it's that nurturing them, it's getting them to like you, it's showing them the behind the scenes that then allows them to jump from that social media follower follower to that I'm an active warm client here and I want to know when new products are coming out when you've got new deliveries and it's just that that jump which actually um is really vital and I think that some sometimes you can get into the habit of just firing out social content and then it's like oh god I've got to send a newsletter this week like I have to do it because it's what everybody tells me that I should be doing whereas I think allowing them to work together is where you really see that success and knowing what social media is about it is influencer driven it's a, a culture of sort of like following um, and then knowing that it's much more action driven and I also think that with email marketing um, you're able to tell a much more effective uh, seamless brand story through email marketing because you you're not fighting against any other noise. You're not fighting against an algorithm. You are able to link directly to your website. So for those people who want it, you're giving it to them in a really simple, savvy way. Whereas sometimes it can get lost on social, but it has its place to support the back end of maybe that nurturing. Would that something that you guys like have seen a bit of within your, within your businesses, Tammy? Yeah, I think definitely like, as you say, when you think, of strategy is quite a scary word because you think it has to be like a very structured approach and you need to touch all the bases and and you know it's true I think all of us um you know we have to think about social we have to think about maybe paid marketing PR email Pinterest like all these different things that we have to think about and sometimes you do get overwhelmed like oh I haven't sent an email in a while and stuff so um I think sometimes you do have to take a step back and think okay how am I communicating my brand story to the customers and also I guess for me I you know I also still have a full-time job while I'm also running this store so I have to kind of prioritize how I'm reaching out to my customers and I do find it a little bit easier to focus my strategy on social media um, and being able you know to speak to them in that way rather than um, you know other channels like email and and videos and, and that sort of thing. But I know I need to get into that as well. So I think every brand's strategy is always continually evolving and you can't focus on everything. 
Mm-hmm. I think just to touch on what um, Tammy said as well, like it is very easy to kind of feel like, um, oh, I need to do like emails, I need to do social, like there's so much to think about. And um, with social media, I think what we found um, like Tammy said, it's sometimes easier on social media. I think just because it's the kind of immediacy of interaction that you get with social media, it just makes it feel like you're you're really reaching your customer. Um, and there's also the ability to like interact as well. So we found using like stories um, and interacting on stories with like the buttons and stuff, you know, like voting, you know, asking questions, things like that has has really um, helped with our engagement with our, our customer base. Um, and as well, also Tammy mentioned um, the buying trip that we had recently. I totally forgot to think about speaking about that, but um, that was something that we made quite like a big deal of on social media, just because it's so visual. Um, so um, I run the business with my husband and he went back to Nigeria to source our homeware collection. And we really, really thought like that was just a really great opportunity to tell such a strong story um, behind the product, because I think people want to know that what they're buying, who makes it and kind of be sure that they're buying into something, you know, ethical and, and our customers like the kind of handmade nature of our products and things. So um, social media was um, definitely one of the key um, strategies for us with that. While we're here, and I do know that there is obviously um, a panel um, specifically talking about social media, so I don't want to delve into it too much, but I would love to get um, just some thoughts around um, influencer marketing, because um, I've experienced when done well, um, it can be really, really effective. Um, you know, when you can... Um, when you, you talk about social media, uh, your, your following or whatever it is, you know, you can either sort of like buy it through paid ads, you can build it organically, which is a hard slog, or there's this, this notion of borrowing and leveraging somebody else's audience. And I think the beauty of doing that with um, an influencer is that it's, it's done in a really authentic way. And if you can find that great partnership between influencer and brand, um, you know, I think that that's just that's where the magic really happens for for, for, for this platform. And I, I know and um, some of you have used this. So I would love to hear, you know, and share with um, the, the community what like your experiences have been um, to influence the market and some of the successes that you've seen. We've had some um, some really good success with influence marketing. Um, and I think probably beforehand, one that a very first one I probably didn't realize that it was such a great match and I kind of just thought oh this is fantastic um and then the second time I was thought why has this just gone so badly the first time went <laughs> well and I think it's because you really have to like put in the effort to find out the exact match um but when you do find the match whether it's kind of by accident or through a lot of research um, borrowing someone's audience is such a great way of getting your name out there, um, kind of building that link of trust with their audience. Um, it can be a really great buy-in, um, but it is. I think it can be really difficult to cut through the noise because it. I don't know about everyone else's inboxes, but it can be quite noisy with them. Um, Hi there, would you like to collaborate? And then <laughs> you have to go, oh, no, no thanks. Um, so sometimes it can be quite noisy, but when it kind of doesn't for me it's never happened that way like when the emails come in like would you like to collaborate it's never those emails that I you know have ever taken the opportunity to do so it's always been through people that I've got a genuine connection with um and they follow our journey and we follow theirs and you can just tell that their audience is your audience um and it can be a really great way to to grow your following um and find more more customers yeah. well, what you said Lucy about um, it being the right match is exactly what it is and it takes it actually takes quite a while to find out who the right match is because as you say you you know your right match if you've been following each other's journeys and you've been building a relationship and interacting and engaging with them and I think that the influencers and accounts that we've worked really well with are those where we've actually kind of been friends like become friends and started asking about each other's lives oh how did you get into this how you know 
asking about their kids and then you realize oh wait you know we're getting on really well we clearly like each other and like what each other are doing and actually why don't we make something out of this whereas um in the early days I definitely was um guilty of kind of picking up big accounts and saying hey can I give you something if you do a shout out and I definitely went through that and there were ups and downs and as I gained my own kind of confidence in my own brand I realized you know I don't have to do that I can actually um kind of form a better and more effective collaborations with people and um and also it's not about how many followers they have so I had the opportunity to collaborate with an influencer who's actually quite in the public eye and have like you know millions of followers um but obviously I'm not going to name names but they wanted um kind of six or seven items from my collection which which is quite a lot but because they were such a big influencer I said okay well I'll just give you as much as you want whereas in the past um maybe I've given one vase or you know one item and if they've been completely happy with it and sometimes they don't even ask for anything they said no I'll just do a shout out or we can do a giveaway but you don't actually have to give me anything and that's when you know you really appreciate that um but then comparing that example to another interiors account where they had 25,000 followers which might not sound like a lot but they brought in just as many new followers and just as much new engagement and sales as the influencer that had asked for six items and has million, you know, the two point something million followers. So um, I think it's really about finding the right, the right match, as you say, but also finding followers, um, sorry, finding accounts that you know people think are genuine and authentic as well. Yeah. yeah. I think as well like what both of you are saying like I was definitely sucked into like looking at numbers and and like they had like nice pictures so they'll probably do a good job and things like that um but like you both said it's really definitely about kind of both of you being interested in each other's journey and I think having that kind of genuine interest in your brand um the influencer that you're using is then able to create content that is actually reflective of your brand and engaging to their audience um and I think as well um with kind of like finding the right fits like as well as people that we've talked to we've kind of actually gone through like follower lists like oh do our followers follow them as well like just kind of trying to see like is it the sort of person that people that buy from us would listen to and trust um and so yeah it's definitely definitely huge a huge aspect is kind of that trust thing as well because you don't want to just kind of send out products and it's not a right fit for the influencer either and then their audience is thinking why are you advertising this it's a bit odd <laughs> yeah definitely I think there can be a little bit of um negative conversations around the influencer marketing but I just think it's because you haven't found that right fit both and it's not just about I think what you just said there it's, it's actually about getting a right fit for both of you it's not just about the brand going okay you're gonna get me more followers and and hopefully more sales it is about that feeling authentic and really otherwise they're going to lose their trust through their audience if all of they start to talk about things that aren't don't seem to align and aren't talking about what they've previously been talking about so um yeah but I know we there is a social media specific panel where they they really do look into this but I was just keen to to get your guys thoughts on it um I'm going to do a bit of a bit of a 180 now and just ask you a little bit more about um Obviously, delivery methods are, um, there are so many growing trends at the moment in terms of not just how you're serving your customer, but how you're delivering and really showing up and, and finishing that end transaction, um, you know, to your customers. We're seeing, um, obviously, the rise of click and collect, which has obviously been great in terms of some of the issues that we've seen in the postal systems. And then we're also obviously seeing um, some more unique options arising, particularly with localized deliveries. And this is kind of why I want to tap into it a little bit in terms of um, if you have got a physical store, um, what are those localized deliveries? that you can do whether it's sort of like curbside pickups or things like that because um i think you know that there is this struggle with maybe people are not wanting to venture into their high streets to do the click and collect side of things um but also 
if this is the audience that you're worrying about and this is the consumer that you want to serve, you know, I do think that you're in a place where just ask them, just ask how they want to be served and how you want to deliver to them. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that some of them will happily want to, um, you know, come to your store to be able to get it. Or, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, next day delivery if ordered at 12 p.m or something ridiculous like this and it's like you know you just can't you can't commit to some of those things do you know what I mean like it's just not possible um and just feeling as a slightly smaller uh uh, retailer to feel quite empowered in terms of well no we we only have the two postal days every day through through the co- like through the pandemic because we've not wanted to queue up every day at the postal system um and I do think that that is something that as a physical retailer moving into that digital space it's a new skill to stretch because normally she walks into your store she picks it and she walks out and and that delivery isn't something that you've you've ever had to um to sort of like challenge so Lucy I'd, I'd be really interested to know the sorts of things that maybe you had experienced over the last sort of couple of months and how you've been able to really serve your customers where normally they they popped into your store had a chat and gone what has that new unique delivery look like for you what have you been testing and trialing we've always been online so we were online before we had the store so our online processes have kind of always been there have been challenged for sure in these last nine months but we've always been able to offer yeah, our postal service um but in terms of the actual shop um we've always done click and collect it was always a part of our website design um but it's just it's been used and used and used during the pandemic which is fantastic the first lockdown we actually did um delivery um so we just I think it it felt almost like the first lockdown was kind of almost a bit scarier and people really did it wasn't even an option to ask people to come to the store to collect things so if they had selected um, click and collect we would just deliver it to them Um, but we did have a brand new we we were like I'm in an R in whether it was the right thing to be going out with a brand new baby in a pandemic so we kind of knocked that on the head and all our customers were extremely understanding and then second time around we did click and collect it was before Christmas and it was just so so busy people what even that weren't even that close wanted to come and click and collect because they wanted to get in their car drive get out their car walk (laughs) pick something up and go home. So we felt like people were using it as a bit of a day out. Um, and then we've carried on click and collect this time round. Um, but it's January, there's, you know, there's a dip in sales. People mm-hmm. aren't chomping at the bit to go and buy buy presents and things like that. So we're just kind of looking to see what people want to do. Um, we can only offer one day click and collect in the store because of the homeschooling situation. Um, But I mean, I don't know how you found it, Abby, as well, but our customers have just been extremely understanding. Like we've said to them, oh, we can only do click and collect on a Friday. And they're like, oh, gosh, no problem. Like, it's fine. I'm not in a rush. Like People just seem to be really nice. And it's so refreshing. And I think it's because there's this kind of absolute opposite with Amazon saying, you know, you can order it now and you'll have it in, you know, less than 24 hours. Whereas we're saying please order with us and you can collect on Friday. I know it's only Sunday, but you're going to have to wait all week. And they're like, oh, it's absolutely fine. So it's kind of a real refreshing change from this super like uber fast, fast now, now, now to kind of just slowing down a bit. And people seem to be on board with that, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, good. And I do think that it is just, I love what you said in terms of people have just been so understanding. So yeah, if you, I think definitely just ask them, ask them what they want. Um, I also think as well, the click and collect thing pre-Christmas will have just, you may have asked them to wait seven days for it, but the amount that they could have possibly waited for a postal delivery could have been a lot longer. So it's just the security that they can pick it up and, you know, they know that it's going to arrive on time because that's the time that you've, you've sort of committed to them. Um, so the last thing that I want to um discuss with you lovely ladies is we've talked about a lot of different things and I think and somebody um I think it was Lucy I think you mentioned it a little bit earlier in terms of just really understanding um your numbers your data you know we have talked a lot of different ways in which we can try and encourage traffic onto our websites when you come to a physical store that it's a little bit more limiting you you know what works you know what works for your customer I think when you move into that digital space um 
there's so many more variables there's so many more different things to contend with whether it's you know social media whether it's paid ads uh, email marketing search engines like google and pinterest and all these different things i think it's really important for a business um but also your sanity to to just really understand what's working for you and your customers um what's resonating with them what's having results um you know it's not about trying to do everything um there's a lot of noise telling us all the things that we should be doing um but really focusing on the things that you and your business and your consumers are seeing to work and have impact you know we have seen increased um, amounts of browsing so you know I would encourage people to really look at their websites and see, do they have those loitering areas, blog posts, uh, customer reviews, gallery walls, lookbooks, inspirational things? Do they have, do you have those on your websites? Because I think, you know, we've seen a trend in more browsing, you know, social media. We know that social content on social media is having much more uh, reaction than it did um, pre the pandemic and then also Pinterest Pinterest went through the roof last year because people not only have time to browse but they've actually got the time to sit and read blog posts and customer reviews and learn about a business you know customer trends that we are seeing um and and you know seeing how they're working but also seeing how that's working for you as a business and not necessarily just keep going you've all said you um well, i think it was tammy and Abby said that you really feel comfortable in that um social media world and you find it easy because you're managing so many other things and i think it's about holding on to that and going this is what works for me i can fit it in to my time um I'm not going to try and exhaust myself at doing too many things. Um, have you have you got yourself into a groove now? And I know it will change because it's always going to change. But do you feel like you you kind of know what works for your customer um, in amongst all the different things that we've talked about and just really standing by them and being accountable for them is the best thing for for new retailers that want to take go into the digital space? Is that what they need to be focusing on? I don't think I've found my groove yet because I think that um, as you say the groove is constantly evolving and I think as when you have your own business you always feel like you're not doing enough and actually you can do something more and like I said earlier I really think that um, I've spent a lot of time in the social media on Instagram and I've been nurturing that community and those followings but then my thought is not necessarily thinking oh great cool I've done that that's really good and working I'm thinking okay that works what's the next thing that I need to do to make that work as well so um admittedly it's not like um it's not like a relaxed kind of happy ending you're always kind of thinking what's the next thing that I can do now and and how can I can do something better and I think what you mentioned earlier about data I think that's really important and that's something that I really want to spend more time doing because data is so like it's so informative it, gives, it tells you so much about your customer or what your potential customer is so I'm using um, Shopify as my e-commerce platform and they have a lot of different kind of softwares and solutions and one thing that I've noticed is it tells you what people are searching for on your website and mm -hmm. I have the highest number of searches for mirrors or candles and neither are things that I actually sell on, in my store so I might okay, so people think they're coming to me thinking, oh, she, maybe she sells mirrors or maybe she sells candles and I don't. So I'm thinking, is that something I need to include in my collection? But it, it's like those little things that really help inform what your customers are thinking and looking for. Um, and also, um, you know, when you send emails out, if you're using MailChimp, it really tells you, you know, what links people have been clicking on. And I noticed that if I... Um, have a sale or if I'm doing a product launch and I want to show a few different images of products and then at the end I have a see all actually the majority of people look at the see all and I spent hours deliberating okay which image should I put in this email to capture their attention when actually most people are like okay show me everything you've got I'll go and have a look at it now so like data is really important so um, yeah well yeah I think I know I that answered your question but <laughs> Oh, it definitely did because I think the point is you gain a more educated opinion of your own business like you just said that like I would be thinking oh my god I need to get candles and mirrors but I'd also be thinking so why do people think that I sell candle and mirrors like 
what is it that I've done to get that reaction? I think, you know, this, it just really makes you more rounded and more sort of educated upon how your consumer is perceiving you as a brand if you're tracking and if you're understanding and the link click throughs, those things, you know, um, you get it a lot. It's like, yeah, you create a whole entire email with like 32 different really bespoke links. And then at the bottom, it's like shot the entire collection. It's like, yeah, I'll do that. Like they sometimes just want the most straightforward option. Um, but no, yeah, that definitely answered my question. Um, anybody else, either of you have anything you want to say in terms of just understanding like the numbers behind the business? I think it's just so, so important to just know your numbers inside out it saves you so much time going forward you know I think it was Mike Tyson that said everyone has got a plan until they get punched in the face and I kind of that sums this retail year up for me like we had such a plan last January and we were like wow this year's going to be so great we know our numbers inside out this is our plan and it's solid and then obviously come March we were like oh like what's our plan say now but because we knew the numbers, the plan could kind of stay, you know, we knew what we were dealing yeah. with. We knew what our cash flow was looking like. We knew what our budgets were looking like. We knew what was working pre-pandemic, which obviously definitely changed, but we were able to kind of harness what was working and take that forward. We were, we were so much more time poor in the pandemic, um, but knowing what was working you know historically we're able to kind of carry on with those things and not suddenly go oh actually kind of Pinterest was working really well for us let's just stop that now because we haven't got enough time it's like saying in fact Pinterest was amazing for us that's going to be our priority you know and just looking if we hadn't have had our numbers we could have gone down the wrong route and invested time and money into something that just wasn't worth it so I think knowing your numbers we always look at them well every every week every month but January is like our big number crunch and knowing that has really helped to shape the year that we had and the year we survived so I think it's hugely important. Yeah. Um, I think for us um, I feel like we're like quite a relatively new business so we've just been running for um, a year and seven months or so um, so understanding our numbers is something that we are like kind of just learning so I've actually learned a lot from both of you um, just now um, but from looking at our Shopify analytics it's been really good to kind of see what items people are kind of looking for like Tammy was saying but also like what's kind of been like really popular at any given time and as as we make our products it's really really useful to kind of know what is the most popular product this month, you know, at the beginning of the month and kind of make sure that we always have the right amount of stock because that's something that we kind of struggled with um, starting out. Um, and as well, during the pandemic, our website has kind of gotten so much more busier than we've ever been used to. Because um, when we just started out, we were doing a lot of markets, like makers markets and things like that, and uh, workshops and a lot more kind of in-person things. So our website was there, but it wasn't super busy. But during the pandemic, we've kind of had to understand the numbers and understand our customers so much more than we kind of ever have. So um, yeah, looking at kind of the back end analytics on our website has been kind of like a lifesaver for us. And it's definitely a new skill. I think, you know, when you, you like, it's definitely something that maybe not all retailers are used to. They, you know, create amazing collections. They really understand great product, but actually to kind of step into that really uncomfortable position of, um, you know, checking the numbers and just making sure that what you're doing is actually working and it has the, the return on investment, whether that's your time or financial. Um, and I think that's just a really great way to sort of like summarize in the sense of we read a lot um, in the media and we've read so much over the last 12 months about being nimble and flexible and adapting. And I think sometimes it just sometimes it just doesn't sink in. It just doesn't sink in that you have to put yourself into an uncomfortable place in order to be able to see what's going to work and what isn't, um, you know, just sort of embracing. I think that's just the key word, I think, at the moment that I am saying hourly just embrace the change that is happening because you stand a far better chance of fumbling through it and coming out in a in a small win than if you just are hell-bent on not doing anything differently and really standing by um 
what you used to do or what used to work or well we did this before and it was great and I'm thinking oh but that's not where we are now so I think if you've already had to pivot your business then absolutely great I think it's amazing if you're still in that process of doing so then hopefully some of these things and discussions that we've talked about today will really inspire you to sort of make that um, give you a little bit of confidence a little bit of a boost a little bit of motivation to be like yeah I'm going to give that a go because what is the worst that can happen and it can only push my business um, in a better direction just by being um, more savvy to some of the things that we've discussed so um, yeah I want to thank you um, ladies so much for joining me today I have thoroughly enjoyed chatting to you and your insight and yeah just having a little bit of a look at your backgrounds over the last couple of weeks before we were chatting I've just loved seeing just where you've all had such great success over the last sort of nine months and you should be incredibly proud of yourselves the fact that you're here and you're standing and thriving not just surviving you're doing really well and um, finally I want to say thank you so much to the um the top draw community for obviously joining us um, and listening to uh, what we've all had to say and um yeah I hope it's been u- useful to you all and we'll speak to you all soon